number one fighter squadron is the senior squadron of the Royal Air Force. Its role today has changed little since its formation three quarters of a century ago. Then its pilots were defending the Allies against the might of Germany. Today they form part of NATO's European Strategic Reserve. Their role to support the troops at the front line. <laughs> The first really significant date uh, in one squadron's lineage as a traceable unit is the formation of the Air Battalion of the Royal Engineers in February 1911. Uh, and the Air Battalion had two companies. Number one company, which had the balloons and the airships. Number two company had the aeroplanes. Then when they formed the Royal Flying Corps the following year in 1912, the number one company of the Air Battalion became number one squadron of the Royal Flying Corps. Uh, which I think gives rise to the, this uh, claim of ours that the lineage is traceable all the way back to the beginnings of British aviation. Michael Shaw was with the squadron from 1969 to 1971, at a time when the unit was converting to the world-famous Harrier, which proved itself so successfully in the Falklands campaign, its first real testing ground. The hallmark of number one squadron is its teamwork. The role of the individual ace, as it were, uh, was almost deliberately played down. And one, I think, was a, was a squadron that has always tended to, to major on its teamwork, particularly at times like the Battle of France. But joining what was to become Britain's elite was not as difficult as you might imagine. They just asked you if you knew anything about engines. Strangely enough, I'd got a motorbike at that time, and all I knew about was my motorbike. So that was the reason I stepped forward being of a very young age, of course. 92-year-old Morris Boot from Coville in Leicestershire is a Royal Flying Corps veteran. He volunteered shortly after the formation of the RFC. Morris Boot flew many of these early planes, but his training and flying career was not without incident. I had a, a fine pilot, and this will give you an idea of the amount of training I got. This pilot was a Canadian, Lieutenant Gilray, his name was, and he never flew unless he was k -lied. And what instruction I got was uh, cringing in the back while he was doing his stunts round the aerodrome. Then there was the incident with the latrines. I remember on this occasion, flying a Morris Longhorn, the uh, aileron that came up out the front got under the, the roof of this hut and took it with it, you see. And uh, lo and behold, there was a gentleman sitting on the toilet which was very amusing at the time. Of course, I didn't know, but then I learned that afterwards, you see. <laughs> then there was the brush with the barn. We had to land over the barn into the wind, of course. You always did. But uh, whether it was the strong wind or, or what happened, or whether it was my misjudgment, I landed on the roof of the barn instead of on the ground. <laughs> Number One Squadron was in the thick of the fighting on the Western Front. Its role, as always, supporting the troops in the battlefield. Conditions were primitive and casualties heavy. Certainly in the days when they were employed as a reconnaissance outfit, they lost a lot of people on long reconnaissance over the lines, but then fortunately for the squadron, uh, it was designated as, as a scout squadron, what we today call a fighter squadron, in the beginning of 1917, and they've been employed in that role almost continuously ever since. But the golden years for the Royal Air Force and Number One Squadron were between the wars. 
It was a time of long summers, air shows and pageants. It was a new era of aeroplanes and a new breed of young men to fly them. were very fortunate indeed in that they lived a fairly glamorous life in what was rudely described as the finest flying club on earth. Floodgates opened and uh, the Blitzkrieg against France and the Low Countries began. Uh, and the, one of the most extraordinary episodes in the history of number one Scotland and indeed the Royal Air Force took place when they moved back five or six times over the next uh, two or three weeks. They shot down over a, a hundred German aircraft, confirmed, and they uh, lost two pilots. The Hurricane was a tank. The Spitfire was a Rolls Royce. Which we'd rather go to war in, I mean, that was the answer. The spit was faster, but he couldn't take the punishment a hurricane could take. He could blow a hurricane to pieces and the bits would always get home. The squadron flew hurricanes for most of the war and distinguished themselves yet again in the Battle of Britain. But they were denied the spoils of victory as the squadron was pulled out before the final conflict and sent for a recuperation period to their present base at Wittering. As the tide slowly turned and the Allies took the offensive, the squadron returned south to their ancestral home at Tangmere to begin their very successful night intruder raids. The CO, uh, McLaughlin, who only had one arm, and the Czech, Carol Kuttelbacher, really excelled in this role. It's very individualistic business of snooping around over German airfields at night, waiting for people to put their lights on to land and then uh, shoot them down. In 1942, number one was re-equipped with Hawker Typhoons. These were large, formidable beasts and inflicted heavy damage on the Luftwaffe. But the Typhoons were not without their teething problems. The engines had a tendency to seize, as Wing Commander Wilkinson recalls. The only way to keep them going was to, what I did later, got some uh, Ida downs, and you wrapped it all around the engine to keep it warm and run the engine every four, every four hours. Once you kept the engine warm, never let it cool down. I did over 100 hours of mine, it was against average of 10 or 15 hours. But they're quite safe because uh, when the engine cut out, you merely put down the new fuel. No matter what you hit, it would go through it. You know? Not telegraph pole and trees didn't matter, really, you just not go down. They were very, very tough indeed. The end of the war coincided with the beginning of the jet era. The squadron was equipped with meteors and then the famous Hawker Hunter. It was at this time, the 50th anniversary of the Royal Air Force, to be precise, which spawned an incident which has gone down in the annals of RAF history. One of the squadron's flight commanders flew under Tower Bridge. And that flight commander was Flight Lieutenant Alan Pollock. I was virtually over London Bridge before I saw Tower Bridge. And there it was, I mean, it was sort of blocking my view. And I mean, it was just, I, I, I knew that I'd broken the old regulation, so I thought, well, uh, I'll, I'll study this. Time seemed to stand still. I had a lot of time to consider it. In fact, it was six seconds, but that six seconds is an awful lot of time. There was this marvellous red London bus that was a quarter way across on the left, and uh, that obviously made me decide also to go very high. And uh, right at the last minute, I mean, there was steel girders all around me, and I suddenly, in the microsecond that 
my cockpit was underneath it, I remembered I'd got a fin behind me and I wasn't too certain whether the fin was going to go through. There was only one cyclist, apparently, who fell off his cycle, I think, because he, he tore his trousers. And I never got the bill, but I'm quite prepared to pay for <laughs> his, <laughs> his repaired trousers. I think uh, the reaction in the Air Force was uh, split between those who thought it was uh, uh, a very uh, laughable and uh, if slightly foolhardy action, uh, but a good show, and those who were uh, really rather appalled. Well, I, I think there are two ways of viewing everything, but I think life's too precious not to do something daft at least once in your life, and preferably everyone ought to do it more often. In June 1968, the squadron moved north to their current home at Wittering. There awaiting them was the shiny new Hawker Siddeley Harrier. And for the second time in its history since the ballooning days, the squadron went vertical. I'd uh, already done one tour on the Hunter in, in the Middle East and uh, had joined number one squadron just about the time when it was announced we were going to get the Harrier and going to be the first vertical takeoff squadron in the world. Of course, this was a big thrill to be part of that process. And uh, we had no two-seaters or flight simulators in those days, of course, so converting to the airplane was tremendous fun because it was a matter of reading the book and getting in and, uh, and trying it all for the first time. The great beauty of the Harrier is it can operate off semi-prepared strips or surfaces. So we can operate from almost any airfield or any base. We can go out into farmer's fields, for example, or operate off a highway, a motorway, whatever. For this reason, the squadron is extremely mobile. Four months are spent abroad in just those kind of situations. Popular exercise takes them beyond the Arctic Circle. Flying into the Norwegian town of Tromsø and the NATO base at Bardafoss, the first time visitor is amazed by the sophistication of this sparsely populated land. The terrain is ideal for the sort of work the squadron could be required to do. We have to train continuously uh, during peacetime, so uh, we provide a credible deterrent. If we lose our credibility, uh, then that deterrent may not be effective, and that could jeopardize our safety. So it's all about preparedness, really, and as long as uh, any potential aggressor views us as uh, a force we reckon with, then hopefully they won't engage us. This is the northern tip of the NATO defense umbrella. The squadron is operating just 300 miles from the Russian border, strategically a sensitive area. Well, the Russians take an interest in what we're doing all the time, and there's, there'll be stuff off the coast listening to us even now. Um, they do test the Norwegian air defenses. It's slightly outside our... Um, sort of remit, if you like. Uh, so the F-16s and so on will launch in response to the Russians uh, probing. So if, this, if they came in and buzzed you this time, what would you do? Get very excited, I think. <laughs> Try and get some pictures of them like everybody else does. But we would react and see how they reacted, I suspect. On this occasion, the exercise is to knock out a ferry crossing. It gives the crew an ideal opportunity to seek out and destroy a typical target. But the people on board needn't be concerned. We've got a 16mm film camera which uh, looks through the gun sight and it records everything that you uh, call up in the weapon system there. That gives you some indication of whether you've actually found the target and uh, got into the right range before you release the weapon. But it's also important for the aircrew to practice with real ammunition. This is usually done on the many ranges back in Britain. The Norwegian exercise is not just for the benefit of the air crew. The ground crew, too, is stretched to the limit to keep the planes flying in extreme conditions. In Bordefoss, they store the aircraft in huge rock hangars, a legacy from the German occupation during the last war. 
It takes 40 ground crew to keep the four planes flying. Everybody is keeping watch on every person all the time they're outside. Limited periods outside. I don't really keep them outside for more than an hour and a half. And obviously clothing. Make sure they've got the correct clothing. A lot of medium weight woolens, big parkers, boots. Keep them out of the cold as much as possible. Another time, the air and ground crews will disperse to Deci on the Mediterranean island of Sardinia. The contrast couldn't be more extreme. The temperatures are usually in the 90s, and here the Brits have a rare chance to take on the Top Gun Yanks. And guess what? The Americans play at being Russians. They even copy their tactics. The overriding feature of the aircraft itself strongly resembles what we look, think looks like a McLean 21 aircraft that the uh, Russians developed. And it's close to the McLean aircraft, the MiG-21, in uh, performance. For the purpose of this exercise, a special pod is fitted to the Harrier. It looks like a missile, and in a way it is. The system is called the ACMI and simulates on computer the complete combat or dogfight. The benefit of ACMI is exactly this. It reconstructs the fight for you. You know exactly what happened. Every detail of the fight is there. Every performance characteristic of the aircraft is there. The weapons envelopes are there. You can see exactly what happened. The facility is expensive, about a million pounds per combat course. But number one's commander, Ian Stewart, thinks it's well worthwhile, particularly in training rookie pilots. Some of the younger pilots have uh, learned some hard lessons, but it's right that they should learn it in an environment like this, which is a training one. The instrumentation of the range allows us to come back, as you've seen, and debrief very, very carefully. And there is no room for manoeuvre at all. If someone has made a mistake, then it stands out loud and clear. And they all know they've made a mistake. And that sort of training was invaluable when the squadron was called south to fight in the Falklands War in 1982. The squadron's participation in the Falklands War was magnificent. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And we were all very proud of, of what uh, the inheritors of the uh, squadron's tradition actually wrought down there. Um, six of number one's Harriers went down uh, south on the deck of Atlantic Conveyor and then were uh, flown across to the deck of Hermes by uh, six of the squadron's pilots, many of whom had never actually even seen an aircraft carrier before in, the, in their lives, let alone landed on one. And over the next few weeks, they operated from Hermes uh, and flew about 130 operational sorties onto the islands, uh, starting at about the time of the landings at San Carlos. We lost three of those six aeroplanes uh, to ground fire. Uh, one to a, to a blowpipe missile and uh, two to anti-aircraft fire. Uh, but all three pilots managed to eject safely. One was taken prisoner, one survived by the skin of his teeth over Goose Green, who had been shot down at 100 feet. And Jeff Glover, who now flies with the Red Arrows, was that only prisoner of war. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's anything to be proud of, actually, uh, <laughs> be, being shot down. Um, yes, I did get shot down. Um, on my first ground attack mission and uh, spent seven and a half weeks with the Argentinians as a prisoner. I knew the missile site was there, but uh, it was a little bit closer than I was led to believe from our intelligence. And uh, it blew the tail off. And uh, Sea Harry without tail doesn't fly very well. It went uh, head over heels. And I jumped out almost instantly, but I, I reckoned I was upside down at the time. And indeed, I think that ties in with what ground reports subsequently said and uh, parachuted into the sea. Ian Mortimer, who's executive officer still with number one, was attached to the Navy and sea harriers at the time. But what did he feel on his first real mission? Petrified. But, I mean, the first thing I knew it was going to happen was when I was airborne being vectored towards uh, an Argentinian aircraft that was coming looking for me just as I was going looking for him. And the training stood us in good stead. I think the major difference that I try and push very hard to the chaps here is the element of fear that you don't have in training. And uh, like I say, petrified, I wasn't joking. Um, we really were. And you had to overcome that and get on and do the job. 
If and when number one squadron is called upon again to do the job, they'll be equipped with the latest version of the fatal Harrier, the GR5. It's a process of constant upgrading and improvement. The GR5 is a very different animal to the GR3, the new Harrier to the old Harrier. It's uh, got much greater range, greater payload. It's got greater self-defense capability, and it's a much more advanced weapon generally than the GR3. But essentially, it does the same job. We still aim to support the army, either at the battlefront or preferably further back. But with today's high technology, the question must be asked, is the human factor really necessary? Surely missiles would do the job better. Might be very efficient, be very boring for me. But uh, I, I think personally that technology and uh, the manned aircraft can live side by side. The manned aircraft gives you one thing that the unmanned aircraft will never do, and that's judgment. There are times if you're having a blanket defense uh, when a machine can do the job and you've got missiles completely surrounding you and you just lose off of anything that it comes within your sphere of responsibility. But I think in the sort of wars that we may be faced with in the future, judgment's going to be a key factor, and that's when you need men in the cockpit. And the other question is a moral one. How do the men, and mainly family men at that, equate the fact that despite all the glamour, they're trained to be killers? Anybody who joins the forces in a role like this should have clearly thought that through beforehand and decided that, uh, come the crunch, the decision is not theirs to make, it is made for them. We are trained to, sure, kill, should we have to, uh, kill machinery rather than men, is, is how we look at it. Our job is to stop tanks stop them being brought to bear against our own forces. Shoot down aircraft before they can come and kill our civilians. They're paid to do what I'm paid to do. They were trying to kill me, I was trying to kill them. It's not a nice world, but uh, it wants to be true. If the government of the day, which after all is our master at the end of the day, if that decides that we are to go and do a job, we will go and do it. And I think we'll do it very well. And if it came to the crunch, would you think twice? No.